thanks a lot uh, for all those kind words good morning everyone uh, my two disclosure before i start this is an abbot sponsored session and i am speaking after krishna so after a classic session by dr krishna an oration i am always a fan of his uh, it is going to be a sort of commercial break here so what i am assigned to talk about is role of dpp4 sglt2 inhibitors in addressing care me syndrome this term has been recently coined over last about 5 years or so earlier days we were talking about a glucocentric approach and management of type 2 diabetes as krishna very rightly said things are evolving fast so in terms of our understanding about pathophysiology in terms of how we address our patient with type 2 diabetes so we have evolved to a different approach which is cardio renal metabolic approach and let me present you a snapshot what is cardio renal metabolic interaction we all know persistent hyperglycemia insulin resistance induce huge amount of oxidative stress he very rightly said it is a defensive physiological mechanism because inflammation is a defensive mechanism but moment it goes up with persistent hyperglycemia with advanced glycation and products with neurohormonal and inflammatory response which persistent hyperglycemia then induces there is going to be a fluid overload which not only on one end leads out to a cardiac congestion obviously with an overload there is a reduction in cardiac output which induces cardiac fibrogenesis on other end there is a renal congestion with fluid overload that further reduces renal function a renal fibrogenesis and then sets in a stage for development of chronic kidney disease and let me tell you it is a cardiovascular disease which is a primary complication of diabetes maybe you may talk about microangiopathy or macroangiopathy but most of our patient they die of a cvd or a coronary artery disease about 65% of deaths are because of cvd disease stroke risk is very high of almost 2 to 4 times heart failure goes up by almost 2 to 5 times and so is the coronary artery disease and mind it there is no hva1c threshold which is apparent when a cardiovascular complication may start in there is a data there is a huge evidence that actually cvd starts much earlier before the onset of type 2 diabetes almost by 5 to 10 years so actually even at the stage of igt or p diabetes you could have a much higher cardiovascular risk another important thing which we learned over last 10 years or so we always ignored what is heart failure but today we understand heart failure is the first manifestation of type 2 diabetes it is related cv disease which is much comes much earlier than mi stroke as early as within 5 years so here is a cohort study of 1.9 million huge cohort those who were followed for a duration of almost 5.5 years and mind it only 2% patient they had diabetes at the time of enrollment and all these patient they were free of cvd and they were followed for a duration of about 5 years and pad and heart failure were the first manifestation two most important manifestation which came as early as within 6 years were pad and heart failure actually myocardial infarction and stroke although these is these are still opted to be the primary outcomes for any type 2 diabetes when we talk of cv outcomes but actually it is the pad or heart failure which is much more important so here is a suggestion that for future studies we must include heart failure or maybe pad as a outcome also which could be a fourth or fifth cv outcome so cv mortality in type 2 diabetes another study of about 1.5 lakh patient with newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes they were followed for a mean duration of 9.7 years and the effect of heart failure development was correlated moment there is an onset of heart failure whether it will worsen overall cvd or overall cv outcome and again it was heart failure which came one of the first manifestation and within 5 years there was an increase in overall risk of cv death that means it is heart failure which is much more important but unfortunately it has not been identified or appreciated so heart failure type 2 diabetes is a very very dynamic it's a bidirectional two way physiological link on one end you have persistent hyperglycemia with insulin resistance which leads on to a rampant atherosclerosis 
and onset of CVD or CAD and with microangiopathy. There is going to be a cardiomyopathy which these days we label it as preserved heart failure. So not only it's an atherosclerotic heart failure which is important, even a preserved heart failure which is actually a microangiopathy is very, very important because they ultimately lead on to endothelial dysfunction, reduction in energy efficiency which then leads on to worsening of chronic heart failure which then stimulates your sympathetic nervous system, induces hypoxia, cytokines, and ultimately induces severe insulin resistance. So on one end, with type 2 diabetes, you have a much higher prevalence of chronic heart failure. On another end, if you have chronic heart failure, by increasing insulin resistance, it will also increase the prevalence of type 2 diabetes. Let's come to the second important aspect, that is diabetic nephropathy. 40% of diabetic, they develop diabetic kidney disease. And mind it, there is a data that in US, all those patients, those who are ending up with hemodialysis, 50% of them at least are type 2 diabetes. So it is type 2 diabetes then leading on to so frequent happening of CKD or diabetic kidney disease. But heart failure and CKD, I told you these are very, very common comorbidities and they again have a bi-directional very, very dynamic link to each other, not only with type 2 diabetes and persistent hyperglycemia, there is a greater risk for onset of heart failure. These days, we are not classifying it like NYHA 1, 2, and 3. It is stage 1, stage B, stage C, and stage D. And simultaneously, you have reduction in EGFR. So, moment there is a reduction in EGFR, it also increases the prevalence of heart failure. And if you have heart failure, that also is going to worsen overall prognosis by induction of CVD. So, 63% patient heart failure, they have renal impairment on one end. And there is a three times more risk of heart failure in patient of CKD as compared to non-CKD individuals. So, every 10 ml reduction in EGFR could increase the mortality by 7% by increasing heart failure. So it's a vicious cardio-renal interaction with a very, very complex interaction between heart failure and CKD, what you have alluded to, which then leads on to de deterioration of both the organ function. So on one end, you have worsening of heart failure, which then leads on to a compensatory mechanism to restore cardiac output. There is a increased venous pressure which then leads on to sympathetic nerve stimulation, natriuresis, and that leads on to hyperperfusion of the kidney. So moment there is a pro progression of heart failure, obviously renal perfusion is going to be impaired, which then leads on to apoptosis and fibrosis, and then leads on to worsening of uh, diabetic nephropathy. So let's see what are the updates in terms of recent guidelines. 2022 recent ADA guidelines which talks about patient profile based approach for management of type 2 diabetes. Certain things have changed since 20 and 21. Not only with these days we are talking of a patient centric approach. First line of course therapy that depends on the comorbidities with patient centered treatment factors which includes cost. This is for the first time ADA has highlighted. So cost is also important. Not every patient will be able to afford a innovator SGLT2 or GLP-1 receptor agonist, oral or an injectable. And managing management needs generally, ideally, again, we have to start with metformin. Our own guidelines, RSSD, ASI, we say every patient has to be on metformin until unless there are issues with tolerance or there are issues that metformin cannot be prescribed after the lifestyle modification. But if you have presence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart failure, incipient or manifest, or diabetic nephropathy, then of course, you may not start with metformin, or if patient is already on metformin, your patient must be on either SGLT2 inhibitor or maybe on GLP-1 receptor agonist. But if there is a heart failure, SGLT2 has to be there, irrespective of the baseline glycemic control. Even if patient is already having an HV1C close to 6.8 or 6.5, which is an ideal one, you will have to step down other therapies to make a place for SGLT2 to get benefits in terms of reduction of CV mortality, to get benefits in terms of 35 to 40 percent reduction in hospitalization with heart failure. So if you have CKD, which is manifest or maybe incipient, there again also you'd like to start with SGLT2 inhibitor and then subsequently for better glycemic control, you might choose a drug like DPP-4 for good glycemic control. ACE 2020 also again talks about the same 
it says that it has to be an individualized approach. All those patients, those who have, those who are not at a greater risk for hypoglycemia, they might target anything HV1C less than 6.5. But all those who are at a little greater risk uh, of hypoglycemia, their HV1C more than 6.5 may be good enough. After lifestyle modification, again, it has to be an individualization. If baseline HV1C is less than 7.5, monotherapy could be in the form of metformin or GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2, but first add-on for in form of after metformin as a dual therapy or triple therapy you could see is the best option is DPP-4 in these patients, not only for good glycemic control, but also for getting other benefits. Even uh, European Society of Cardiology, ESD guideline 2019 for the first time said that all those patients, those who are dr drug naive, if they have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, let them be on SGLT2 receptor or GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist. Or if they are already on metformin, choose one of these options. But if these factors are not there, there you could choose any other drug, which could be again, uh, best option could be DPP-4 with placebo-like side effects. So let's talk about combination of SGLT2 inhibitor and DPP-4 in management of type 2 diabetes. I don't need to go into the details of ominous octet where they said that you have almost eight defects contributing towards pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. But if you add two drugs, DPP-4 and SGLT2 inhibitor, uh, along with metformin, you are able to address at least six defects in the setting of type 2 diabetes, which could be a, a, a decrease in creatine effect, decrease insulin secretion from the beta cell, or even suppression of uh, overexpress alpha cells by drugs like DPP-4. So once you combine two drugs, which are SGLT2 with DPP-4, they have a complementary action. Not only you produce gluco, uh, glucosuria and reduce lipotoxicity and glucotoxicity with DPP-4, you not only improve the expression of beta cell, you also suppress over-excess alpha cell, so glucagon goes down. That is how both the drugs work together wonderfully. And here is a meta-analysis, SGLT2 with DPP-4, change in baseline HV1C versus alone DPP-4. Obviously, if patient is already on a combination of DPP-4, you could see that everything is on the left side of the bar. Obviously, HV1C reduction will be great. So will be if patient is already on a combination of SGLT2 with DPP-4. Again, change in HV1C versus alone SGLT2 will be much better with a combination. Not only that, base, it also depends what is the baseline HV1C. Higher is the baseline HV1C. Greater is going to be reduction with SGLT2 and DPP-4 and same is true if patient is on combination versus SGLT2 inhibitor. Not only that, you get a better fasting reduction also if your patient is on simultaneously a combination of SGLT2 inhibitor with DPP-4 because then obviously fasting correction is going to be much better than, than being alone on DPP-4 or alone being on SGLT2. These are all published meta-analysis of Combination therapy versus alone DPP-4 or SGLT-2, either in terms of getting HVNC reduction, a fasting reduction, or overall improvement in metabolic profile, which means not only you get a good HVNC reduction, you get a weight reduction also, and overall there are benefits in terms of uh, metabolic value getting improved. But, but well, there is always a relative risk of hypoglycemia, which is very, very little, until unless patient is simultaneously on secretagogue like sulfonylurea. Otherwise, with SGLT2, DPP-4, risk of hypo is not there. But if you add a combination right in the beginning versus a sequential addition of SGLT2 and DPP-4, even that risk of hypo is much lesser. So is the risk of urinary tract infection. If patient is on a dual drug or FDC of SGLT2, DPP-4, you could see that first di uh, this diamond bar is on the left side. That means the risk of UTI is not much. There could be little increase in risk of GTIs once pa patient is in a combination of DPP-4 and SGLT2 because of SGLT2. But again, it has been seen if the patient is on simultaneous combination of SGLT2 with DPP-4 inhibitor, actually GTIs are much lesser. So it makes huge sense when we say that 
we must use along with metformin a fdc or a combination of cetagliptin and metformin which are the most evidence based drug today not only in terms of getting a significant hunc reduction within 24 weeks you could see it is coming down as early as within 24 weeks which is very very meaningful overall body weight goes down there is a fasting reduction systolic blood pressure also comes down so there are all the benefits a patient is already on metformin and you add a combination of dapa with cetagliptin even adverse events are balanced between both the groups and discontinuation rate is very very low genital infection may be more versus placebo once obviously patient is on sglt2 inhibitor but mind it if you have added a combination of sglt2 inhibitor with dpp4 right in the beginning after metformin not sequentially even genital infection rate is much lesser utis are balanced there is no increase in uh, risk of getting uti so these results suggest that in patient with type 2 diabetes those who are inadequately controlled already on metformin or cetagliptin it makes sense that patient is already on metformin add a combination of dpp4 as well as sglt together rather than giving it sequentially because then benefits are much more and here is our own evidence a decision making algorithm which may help how to use this combination of sglt2 inhibitor and dpp4 so once it comes to management of type 2 diabetes this algorithm suggests that combining sglt2 with dpp4 as an fdc based on glycemic factors obviously if patient is drug naive metformin if patient is not able to tolerate otherwise patient will be on metformin as a first line option but patient is not able to tolerate metformin or there are issues with metformin then any hunc more than 8 you may state way start with the combination of sglt2 inhibitor with dpp4 and if patient is already on metformin and still hunc is more than 8.5 straight way you may add a combination of cetagliptin with the sglt2 inhibitor like dapagliflozin even in those patient those who are on insulin because the requirement will be much lesser so based on cv risk also as uh, ada and ace guidelines have said if there is a presence of multiple cv risk or presence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease there again it makes huge sense that you start with sglt2 dpp4 inhibitor right in the beginning after metformin and if patient has incipient or manifest diabetic nephropathy again this combination makes huge sense because you will get all the benefits of dapa and drugs like cetagliptin which are absolutely neutral of course you need to reduce the dose as egfr is going down maybe about 50 mg may be good enough but not only it will promote weight loss and it will also prevent episode of hypoglycemia thank you very much for your patience listening you have any questions i will be more than happy to answer that